Hello, and welcome to Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. My name is Ben Hauck, and I'm pleased to be able to introduce the 11th episode in our ongoing series. For our July 2023 podcast, Lance Strait interviews novelist, literary scholar, and science fiction critic Marlene Barr. Dr. Barr is the author of two novels, Oi Pioneer and Oi Feminist Planets, and a number of works of feminist science fiction, including Alien to Femininity, Speculative Fiction and Feminist Theory, Lost in Space, Probing Feminist Science Fiction and Beyond, Feminist Fabulation, Space slash Postmodern Fiction, and Genre Fission, a new discourse practice of cultural studies. Her most recent book, just published by Dark Helix Press, is a short story collection entitled The Former President, Science Fiction as Retrospective Retro Rocket Jettisons Trumpism. Their discussion covers feminism, literary theory, science fiction, and politics. Let's listen in. Hello, my name is Lance Strait, and I'm here with Marlene Barr for our July podcast episode of Semantic Reactions. Marlene uh, is the author of two novels and a number of works of science fiction criticism. And her most recent book is entitled The Former President, Science Fiction as Retrospective Retro Rocket Jettisons Trumpism. Uh, And welcome, Marlene. Thank you, Lance. I'm glad to be here and thank you for having me. Well, it's good to have you here. And before we get into your new book, uh, which I understand just came out, let's talk a bit about your background. Uh, you're pro- you're a native New Yorker, that's right? Lance, anybody, you, I said hello and I said thank you for having me. And anyone on this planet who hears me say that knows without any doubt that I am a native New Yorker. I have never lost this accent and I'm proud of it. Very good, very good. And you you uh, specifically uh, grew up in Queens, is that correct? I grew up in Forest Hills. Which uh, happens to have been the official address of the Institute of General Semantics for some years now. Yes, on uh, Austin Street. Yeah, although that'll probably change in, at some point. But, uh, but sure, so, uh, you know, it's the same kind of accent as, uh, say, Fran Drescher who went to my high school. Same accent as Fran Drescher. And although my accent is very discernible, I am not as nasal as she is. Right, right. I guess you went to Forest Hills High School? I went to Forest Hills High School, and it was my hardest academic experience. I see. (laughs) There were two twins, Robert and Gary Katzman, and Robert Katzman became a a very famous judge. And there was an English teacher, Mr. Wolfson, and he lined up Gary and Robert in front of the class and he said, Katzman, Robert, what is your average? And he said, 99.26. And then he said, Katzman, Gary, what is your average? And Gary said, 99.5. And Mr. Wilson said, well, then you're you're the best Katzman. And you, I'm going to call you Katzman the first. Huh. And I never had, I never had any, any academic experience that was harder than Forest Hills High School. Well, so where did you go from Forest Hills High School then? I went to the State University of New York at, at Albany. And when I went, I was very scared because I thought that I wouldn't be able to get any food because I was going to the wilderness. <laughs> ah, yes, upstate. SUNY Albany then, and, and were you an English major? I, I knew that I wanted to be an English professor because of my high school teacher, Mr. Wilson. And I went to Forest Hills High School with, with um, Betsy Walheim, the daughter of Donald Walheim of Dawn, of, Dawn, of Dawn Books. And she also loved Mr. Wolfson. He had a whole coterie. And he was just the coolest high school teacher. And I said, I want to do this. And I, and I, want, to, I want to be an English professor. And I knew always that I wanted to do science fiction. Oh. And I, I, went to, I went to Albany. And all right, I'm going to say that I don't care. Uh, my mother wanted me to go to Queens College because she did not want me to learn about sex. And my father, <laughs> my father looked at her and said, Rosy, Marlene could learn about sex at Queens College. So I got to go. 
<laughs> I got to go. I got to go as far away as at, at, as Albany, and I did learn about sex, but not until I was a sophomore. Ah, uh, but in either way, it's a New York State experience. Yes, and uh, not not an out of state experience. No, and I got my. I, then I went to master's degree school at the University of Michigan. And there was a science fiction professor there named Eric S. Rapkin, who I'm still best friends with from that time. And I went to Eric and I said, hello, I want to be your grader. Can I please be your grader? I want to be like you. And I call myself Marlene S. Barr because he calls himself Eric S. Rapkin and I wanted to be, have an S too. So, oh. so, so I'm S. So I'm still to this minute friends with Eric after, after all of these years. And then Michigan was a very conservative English department and they did like Renaissance and and I got A minus in everything because I was being political. So I had another professor, Peter Balland, who was a who was a German Jewish refugee. And Peter told me that I should go to Buffalo. Peter, what what was his last name again? His name his name was Peter Balland. And he is the one Could you spell that? I couldn't quite B A U L A N D and uh. Peter told me to go to Germany on Fulbrights. And I only, being from Forest Hills, Germans did not sit well there for the obvious reason. And I went on, I went on three Fulbrights to Germany and, and was a visiting professor at the University of Innsbruck and lived for five years in German speaking countries because Peter told me to go and I trusted him. And he was right. I had very good experiences in, in Germany. Well, and, and you said the, the S then, in Marlene S. Barr stands for? My S stands for Sandra, and Eric Rapkin's S stands for Stanley. I see. And so from Ann Arbor then, that was right. in Ann Arbor, right? Yeah, Peter told me to go, Peter told me to go to Buffalo, and Eric knew Norman Ann Holland, who was, and I just, he did read a response criticism, and literature and psychology. And I didn't very much, I didn't very much like literature and psychology, but I liked, I liked Norm a lot because he was the most brilliant and charming professor that anyone could ever have. And he, he liked his women students and he was, he was totally loyal to his wife, Jane. And he was the best dissertation director that any woman could have had at the time. And I loved him. And once one day I stood him up to my real, my real father was there with Norm. And I said, these are my two fathers and real father, George, meet my academic father, Norm, and shake hands with each other because you're just, you're just great. So I had a, I had a great dissertation director and I had a great father and I named Norman Holland. I named him enormous. Like I was like 22 years old and and I was cute. And I walked into his office and I said, hello, enormous. And Norm, this eminent professor said, Marlene, how do you know? And I said, as you are aware, I don't know, but you're a very big critic. <laughs> so for the rest of my life, I called him enormous. Wow. I can't believe I'm saying this stuff, but all right, <laughs> that's it is. Hey, why not? You know, why but, not? <laughs> it's a podcast. Right? Uh, I don't know you're supposed to say stuff like this on podcasts. Uh, well, we can say whatever we want. Nobody, there's nobody above us to censor us. Uh, okay. That's one of the beauties of it. But uh, weren't, weren't there other major literary uh, figures, literary theorists and critics at, at, this is SUNY Buffalo, right? Right. I also studied, I also studied with Leslie Fiedler. Ah, okay. Also, what was that like? He made a profession out of being Jewish. Ah. And like you tell stories about how he how he taught how he taught at the University of Montana, and he was the only he was the only Jew there, and he would sit in his office he would sit in his office smoking his cigar, and I was really really friends with with Norman Holland. Like when Norm had his lung cancer surgery, and he had one person to call, he called me, and I was sitting at my little assistant professor desk, and and then I knew I grew up. So I wasn't like friends with Leslie like that. I was I was more of a I was more of a student to Leslie, but I really liked him. And in the in about 2000, I went back to Buffalo, and 
I had this like tooth infection in my, and, and I said, the doctor said, if you don't do something about this, it's going to go to your brain and you're going to die. And I said, okay, but I have to see Leslie Fiedler. So I'm just going to go to Buffalo campus and then I'll come back. And I ran into the English department. And I said, Leslie, it's me. I have a tooth infection. I'm really going to die if I don't do something. But I wanted to say hello. Hi, Leslie. And he goes, hello, Marlene. I'm glad to see you. And and then I got my tooth fixed. And that was the last time I ever saw Leslie Fiedler because, because he 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 died he died soon after and he oh. wrote he wrote me a reference and he said that i would do my work under any circumstance and he and he was right so it it really was something to me that little marlene from forest hills could go to buffalo and study with 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 enormous and leslie fiedler and wow. buffalo was very male and it was the, they were like these male people and they they would they were like there was like snow in those days and they they'd go to the english department meetings in their work shirts and their snow boots and they'd sit there and they go fuck you fuck you that um norm did not get into the fu- did not get into the fuck you stuff he he was like more elegant than that but he was department head and he was department head before I got there and people said that he was the worst department head that anyone could ever have but he was a, he was an excellent scholar and excellent excellent writer so it was it was just like this 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 very male place and I just sat there doing my work and none of these men ever hit on me at all and I just did my work uh-huh well, since you bring it up, uh, I'm certainly one of the ways that you identify yourself is as a feminist critic. And I think a lot of people, well, uh, you know, from a general semantics point of view, and the term feminism is a pretty high order abstraction that really means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And of course, there are a lot of misconceptions about it, especially about it being very strident, uh, humorless type of individuals who are associated with that. And so, and, but, uh, and then also, if you know a little bit about feminism, there are also different waves of feminism with different kinds of emphases, some as somewhat at odds with one another. What does it mean to you? What do you, what is your brand of feminism and how do you approach that, that set of ideas? I was in the first wave of women's students that had women's studies. And I sat at Albany and I had a feminist professor named Joan Schultz. And she taught like she taught introduction to women's studies. And I sat there taking notes and I said, this sounds very good to me. And I have one life to live and I want to fulfill my life. I do not want to be a housewife. I want to be an English professor. And I think that there are all of these impediments in the world that hurt women and I don't want them to get me. So what I did was I lived my life so that I could so that I could do my work. When I was young and other people were getting married, I had I had my Fulbrights to Germany, I had my visiting prof- professorship to Innsbruck. I was I spent a year as a visiting professor at the University of Cape Town. And I just went running I just went running all over the world, expressing myself and trying to do academic work. So to me, feminism meant not letting men be an impediment that would stop me from living my intellectual life to the fullest extent. And you mentioned that some people think that that feminists are humorless. As you know, I am hysterically funny. And and I write literary criticism in a way that is hilarious. And I, I once said, I once said to Norm, I once said, enormous literary criticism, it kind of hurts your eyes. And I think it, I think it should be funny and it should be entertaining. And why should it be so dull and jargon ridden and no one can understand this? And Norm said, yes, Marlene, that's a very good idea, except you are the only person who can write that way. So (laughs) no one else could do it the way you do. And I had a 
I had a chance to edit the science fiction issue of, of PMLA. And in the introduction, PMLA I, just publication you know. of the Modern Language Association, which is the most prestigious literary journal in the country. And I had the responsibility of doing doing the, the science fiction L issue. Literary scholarship as opposed to literary author. literary scholarship. And I said, well, what am I going to do to do this? And everyone is going to look at it. And Norm also said, the most important thing is to write in your own voice. And I and I took that from him. And you once told me that you love my voice. So so here you said that to me and I never forgot that. So here I am talking in my voice as I always do. And when I did the introduction to the PMLA issue, I said, okay, I'm gonna write in my own voice. And what I did was I talked about a, a feminist giant talking squid in the introduction to PMLA. And once I was on the top floor of Fordham Lincoln Center and there, there were students there and I was just walking around and I think they were graduate students. And one of them said, that's her, that's her. That's the woman who put the feminist giant talking squid in PMLA. And the women graduate students said, no. And they, they said, yes. And they followed me into the bathroom and they go, are you Marlene Barr? And I go, yes. And they said, you put the giant squid in PMLA? And I said, yes. So to me, feminism is expressing myself in my own voice, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead, being humorous, having fun, Show, being a role model to female students because I was, yes, I was the first feminist science fiction scholar and I had no one to go before me. And I was luck and at Buffalo, there were no senior women. They were just assistant, there was an assistant professor woman. And I was really lucky that Norm and Leslie were very, were very, very supportive of me. And when I ran around Buffalo and I said, Ursula Le Guin is important, Norm and Leslie looked at me and they listened to me because, because as I was, I was right. So feminism to me is not dour. It's the, it's the only way to live. And I was so scared that a man would hurt me that I didn't get married until I was 48 years old. What you're saying now about, certainly about academia, you know, that back in the mid 20th century, it was largely a boys club, you know, certainly male dominated in, in most uh, areas. Uh, you know, there are a few that were more open to women, like I think anthropology, especially with Margaret Mead, was considered one of the areas that women would go into at the time, but that certainly that English uh, was a male dominated field. And you're talking about equality of opportunity, equality in the workplace, which is very much what a lot of feminist politics has been about. But when we talk about feminist theory, uh, you know, particularly literary theory, I mean, what is your, what are your views on, on that? Uh, and who, are, who do you, uh, look to or who have you been you know find conducive to your own thinking in in terms of uh scholarly work my favorite feminist theorist is Catherine stimson and i think i think she is the most elegant articulate role model female scholar that that i have ever encountered and i love her i love her book where the meanings are. And no matter what, Catherine Stimson is always elegantly perfect and brilliant. And I look up to her. And my other favorite feminist theorist is Donna Haraway. Oh. I I absolutely I absolutely love I absolutely love Donna Haraway. And I was responsible for Donna Haraway getting the Science Fiction Research Association Lifetime Achievement in Scholarship Award because, because I, I love Donna Haraway. And I'll tell you my Donna Haraway story. She was speaking at the New School on the same day that I had my interview to, to get a co-op apartment. So to get the co-op apartment, I got dressed up in a co-op apartment getting interview costume. I put my hair back. I put on little, little 
pearl earrings I put on my my mother's wedding ring because I didn't have one of, of my own. I put on heels, I put on stockings, and I walked in as something totally not me. And I wanted to see Donna Haraway at the new school, and I couldn't I couldn't go see Donna Haraway dressed up in my co-op apartment building meeting outfit. So I I ripped off the clothes, put on like like normal jeans clothes, got my wild hair as it should be. And I ran down to the new school to see Donna Haraway. And I was like, I was like awestruck, like, like I'm a fangirl. So I raised my hand in the new school auditorium and I asked a question. And in front of the whole auditorium, Donna Haraway says, that question sounds exactly like something that Marlene Barr would ask. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, there's a very good reason for that, Donna. <laughs> it is because I am Marlene Barr. Hi. Wow. So I love her image of, of I love the cyborg manifesto. And Donna Haraway and, and Catherine Stimson are women who are older than me, who went before. They are, they are the best. And, and I'm, I'm glad they're still here and I could still, I could still talk to them. And, and I don't know, um, I saw Catherine Stimson in the lobby of the grad center, I think just after Trump elect, was elected. And I said, Kate, what are we going to do? And she said, don't worry, Marlene, we're going to be okay. And I said, all right. <laughs> well, uh, and these are great stories, but just wondering, you know, what would you, you know, if you could just sum it up in, in a short kind of pithy way, what is feminist literary criticism? And you know, what is that about for, you know, for folks who are listening who are not familiar with it and may have misconceptions about what that involves? I mean, what would you say folks like, like the ones you're mentioning, uh, you know, are really concerned with? Feminist literary criticism is reading literature in terms of women's experience. Like if you have if you have the story, I think it was this is the idea of Judith Fetterly, that if you're reading Rip Van, Rip Van Winkle, and Rip Van Winkle goes to sleep because Dame Van Winkle is nudging Rip Van Winkle, you don't accept that Dame Van Winkle is a nudge and is 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 bad and she causes Rip to go to sleep. Instead, you look at the experience of Dame Van Winkle, according to Judith Federley, and you say, what are her conditions that caused her to be grating, that, that caused Rip to go to sleep? You just, don't, you just don't assume that the woman is evil. You, you look at the conditions and say, why is this so? And I like, I always think of Judith Featherly's work on Rip Van Winkle. You question it, you are aware of women's condition and you just don't assume that, that women are in these roles. And you don't assume that women are in the background. Uh, like I think of David Lodge novels. I love, I love David Lodge, his academic, his, his academic novels with Morris Zapp, who is Stanley Fish, and he talked about the, the women at the academic conferences fraternizing with men. Well, since I got married at 48, I was the woman at the academic conference fraternizing with men, and David Lodge did not tell my story. So feminist literary criticism means to me telling the story of the woman and not just seeing the woman as an appendage to men. And thinking with David Lodge in mind, I wrote a feminist academic novel, Oi Pioneer, which told the story of being the woman in the academic conference. Mm -hmm. So you don't so oh. you don't read and just put the women in stereotypes and and ignore the women. So, uh, you know, of course, this is related to the fact that much of literature is written by men and so is in some way uh, re reflects a male point of view um, and therefore not a female point of view. Right. So, so in my, 
in my, in my literary criticism work as a feminist science fiction scholar, I read feminist science fiction as thought experiments. That's Ursula Le Guin's term to how do you look at the literature as a blueprint for making the world better for women. And that's why I liked from a feminist critical perspective, that's why I was drawn to feminist science fiction because in realistic literature, like Sylvia Plath's The Bell Jar, the women die. And in feminist science fiction, anything was possible for women. Like in Israel, the Jews do everything, like be the fire chief and, 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 and the police commissioner and the farmer and everything. Well, in feminist separatist planets, like, like Joanna Russ's While Away, in when it changed, the women have to do everything. And nowhere on earth do the women do everything. So it gave me, it, it gave me thought experiments to see how do I live, how do I live my life as a woman in the most productive way that, that I can. That's why I wanted to be a feminist critic of feminist science fiction. And when I started, people said science fiction is shit and feminist science fiction is worse shit. And I stood up and I said, no, it's very important. And men punished me for that. Well, they're all dead and I'm here and I was right. Well, <laughs> well, just to, you know, we'll get to science fiction, but just to, to stick with feminism for, for a little bit longer. I mean, you know, um, arguably in terms of literature, women really enter into it with the with the novel and particularly in the starting in the 19th century is where women get very much involved in the literary world and and then of course the 20th century and to today but you're you know one of the arguments and i, I gather is that there would be a significant differences perhaps not absolutely or always but generally significant differences between works that are written by men as opposed to works that are written by women. Would that be correct? Well, it doesn't hold true because there's a science fiction writer, Alice Sheldon, who wrote under the pseudonym James Tiptree Jr. And, right. and there was a male critic who wrote that James Tiptree Jr. was ineluctably, and he used the word ineluctably, he, um, ineluctably masculine. And for years, people did not know that James Tiptree Jr. was Alice Sheldon, and she had a, a male, uh, she had a stereotypical male life, in that she was she was she worked for the CIA, and she she fooled people. So right. so you 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 can't you can't you can't say that men write this way and women write this way. I think that's that's too much that's too much of a binary. And in my own life, as I said, I had a very male academic life in that I never had children. I got married late. I dedicated my whole self to 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 my to my to my work to my writing, but the only problem was that I'm really female. <laughs> but, but male science fiction scholars sort of always liked me because I was just like them, except I was female. Right, but yeah, you know, and, and I understand, I mean, you know, we certainly have, you know, in genres like science fiction examples where, and, and I guess, you know, just otherwise, but, you know, examples where, women novelists take on a male pen name because they are not going to be accepted otherwise. You know, one of my uh, favorites from uh, when I was a teenager was Andre, Andre Norton, yeah. uh, you know, who wrote uh, these sort of cross time stories that I, I really enjoyed. But uh, in this case, they're, they're kind of masquerading and so trying to come across as men perhaps 
And on the other end of the spectrum, you were pointing to uh, writers who are not just women, but particularly taking on a feminist approach to to their writing. But uh, you know, in terms of fiction writing, uh, and could is there again not in an absolute sense, but are there uh, differences when you get to like you know, say Jane Austen, Emily Bronte, you know, and so forth, uh, and do we see? a kind of shift that can be associated with gender. Well, Jane Austen at the time was writing work analogous to romance novels. So I would answer your question by saying, in terms of literary value, why characterize romance novels as something less than? What I'm trying to say is that if, if women do something, it's devalued. And why would you hail Ernest Hemingway's war novel as being more literarily valuable than someone writing romance fiction? Like why isn't romance fiction valuable? It's about, mm -hmm. it's about human relationships or there is like, there's like, like a, there's a woman who writes shopaholic novels. Well, why isn't going shopping valuable? If you don't go shopping, you're gonna walk around naked and not have food, it's important. So I would say value what the women are doing. And Jane Austen was a romance novelist. And why if someone is writing a romance novel in 2023 would, why would that be less valuable than a man writing about things like war and killing people? Mm -hmm. Well, absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, it brings to mind, uh, was it Janice Radway, the Reading the Romance? Reading the Romance, yes. Where? She's from where? my time. I like Janice Radway. She, what she did for romance literature, I did for science fiction. But... But romance literature was was even seen as worse than science fiction, if that could be. So, so I would say, w why would feminist science fiction and romance literature be be devalued? Be devalued. This is this is very important. And sure. I haven't I haven't seen the Barbie movie yet. Uh huh. <laughs> but 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 it was like Barbie versus Oppenheimer, like like. Here you have someone who, how do I say it, um, invented something causing the dropping of a nuclear weapon on a civilian population. And I've been to Hiroshima and I, Hiroshima, and I pause because it's it's very moving to me. So why is that more valued than? Barbie. Barbie is very important to women. I still have in my very closet in this apartment my original 1961 Barbie doll with all the clothes, and I'm not selling it. Oh, well, uh, you know, but of, but of course, this relates to the you know kind of traditional high versus low culture debates, and shouldn't we uh, be paying attention to popular culture rather than dismiss it or genre uh, works as opposed to ones that are considered quote unquote original and and, and so forth but I, I you know i was thinking you know since you were bringing this up that walter ong argues that when it comes to print literacy uh and as this relates to the novel that what happened was that male education because education until the mid 20th century was entirely segregated by gender you know that male education in in the u.s and in the west was rooted in a kind of rhetorical tradition that still had a, a strong connection to oratory and rhetoric and public address kind of mode and that influ that influenced the early kind of segment of of novel novels and short stories and that women on the other hand as they learn to read and write would do so in a private setting not following that rhetorical tradition that dominated uh schooling you know, at least in the 19th century 
And so they developed the more fully literate, you know, more fully uh, print oriented kind of writing. And in this sense, were the, the ones who brought the novel forward out of this kind of speaking out loud tradition into the more inward turning and uh, kind of approach that we associate with the modern novel. So, you know, that, that suggests a, a distinction between the genders in terms of writing, approach to fiction writing, although one that's not kind of genetic or hereditary or any of that, but rather one that's based on different social circumstances. So I, I was just wondering what you thought about that. Well, I said that I try to lead a male life, except that I'm a female. And when you were talking, I was thinking of Tilly Olson's work, her, her book, Silences. And women, if, if you're a mother of a child, Tilly Olson talked about something which she called the child cry. If you're trying to write and, and your child is crying, you can't, you can't say, you, you can't say, I can't list, go away, kid. I'm writing my book now. <laughs> like, go away, kid. You bother me. Yeah. Like, yeah. Go away, kid. You bother me. I'm, I'm writing, I'm writing my book now. So, and also, no matter how male I wanted to be, I'm heterosexual. So nobody was going to go be my wife. I never had a wife. Mm -hmm. And when I was an assistant professor, the men had wives. And I didn't have one. So no matter how hard I tried, I really couldn't, I really couldn't be a man. So women are in, are in a different boat. And like I won the Science Fiction Research Association Lifetime Achievement Award in 1997. So I was younger then. Like, like I did it, like I, I got, and, and like that is, that's like science fiction people love that award. It's like, it's like the be all and the end all. And it's, it used to be called the Pilgrim Award be, and they changed it because there was something wrong. I guess it wasn't politically correct to call something Pilgrim. I still haven't figured out why, but by me, it's still the Pilgrim Award. So I won the Pilgrim Award in my late forties. And then I said, okay, I did that. That's the pinnacle. Now I could go and maybe marry someone and, and do all of that. But I have not written a full length book since 2000 because, because I couldn't do that and be married. And, and in all these years, I've, I've written short things and I turned to fiction because it's very easy for me to write fiction. But I did all my work. I did enough to win the Pilgrim Award in 1997. So my answer to your question is, no matter how hard you, you try, you're, you're, still, you're still a woman and that's it. And no matter what, I, I can't believe this is coming out of my mouth, but it's a patriarchy and it's a man's world. And this still has not changed. Would you say it's on the whole over your lifetime, it's gotten better? Well, lately it's gotten worse in that the world, you know, what's coming out of my mouth. Yeah. In, <laughs> in that the, like I taught the handmaid's tale in my young life. Yeah. And, I was teaching then at the University of Iowa and I'm very dramatic and I came into The Handmaid's Tale, I was wearing a red dress, red gloves, and I made a white paper thing for my head. And I walked into the classroom and I said, okay, Handmaid's Tale day. And the students were very upset and they said, Dr. Barr, we respect you and we don't want to see you looking like that. So it didn't work. But I never thought that I would be this age and and we would have The Handmaid's Tale with the with I cannot believe that if you live in New York and you live in Texas, that your life is different. And if you leave Texas, you get hunted. This is feminist science fiction coming alive. And it's to me, like, I like my science fiction in books. I don't like to, to live it. And I can't believe that, that I've come to this and the world has become the handmaid's tale. And I've, I, saw, I heard Margaret Atwood say that she didn't make up anything for that, that it, that it was all real. And it's, 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 it's very upsetting. Not, I don't have words. It's, not, it's beyond upsetting. 
And, and and I hear you, and, and and I'm certainly sympathetic. But just taking the really big picture of looking at it over the past over a half century, uh, you know, and for example, when you're talking about. Uh, being a graduate student in all male departments or almost entirely male departments and, and just, you know, the overall culture that uh, existed, you know, at the time that we were kids, wouldn't you say that things have gotten better yes. on the whole? In terms of, in terms of, in terms of academics, yes, even if I look at my own little field, feminist, feminist science fiction, there's a whole coterie of women scholars of science fiction in their 50s who have come after me and there are, there are young women who have come after them. So in my field, the women are not in the position that I was in that I had to go pioneer it and I had to, and I had to be one of the icebreaker boat and I had to plow through the ice field with, with, few, with a few other women that the ice field is plowed. Well, Marley, I just, you know, that we should also recognize the progress that we've made. I mean, as much as we may be disturbed about uh, any kind of reactionary movement or, or folks trying to turn the clock back, but that, that on the whole, I mean, we, you know, we should certainly, um, you know, we should be aware that we, we have moved forward and uh, o over a period of time and, you know, and really celebrate that. Uh, I agree with you. It is, it is, it is better than it was, but I think there is a very big backlash going on. And mm -hmm. if I were a young woman now, I would be screaming my head off in, in the street. I, 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 I would, I would not stand for this. Yeah. And, and again, you know, no, no argument here, but let me shift over to science fiction since you've been talking about that. What is it that you, you know, that got you interested and, and made you, got you to focus on science fiction? My first experience with science fiction was when I was a child and there were Saturday morning cartoons mm. and I would watch, I would watch Mighty Mouse. Like here <laughs> I come to save the day. That means yeah, that Mighty yeah. Mouse is on the way. And, and, it, it sort of made me hate cats because the cats, the cats were the villains. Sure. But I was, I was very drawn to Mighty Mouse and his cape and flying around. And I thought that that was the coolest thing. And also when I was, a, when I was a kid, I didn't have any talent. I was, I was very tall. I was very nerdy. Like my other little friends, like they, they, in Forest Hills High School, like one was the leader of played pro and she was an actress and they could sing and they could they could play the piano and the the 1964 world's fair happened when i was 11 and the and i went to ps 196 which was on grand central parkway so you could hear like the fair being built and they took the glee club and they sent it to the new york state pavilion to sing and I wasn't allowed to go because I couldn't sing well enough and I had to stay back at PS 196 when people went to the World's Fair. So I really had no talent and the only thing that I knew how to do was read. And my mother took me to the Forest Hills branch of the New York Public Library, which is still there as it was. And she let me take out, she let me take out all the books that I wanted. And my my uncle was a, was a founder of Bantam Books and he was an accountant and he didn't care if he was selling toothpaste and he got all the books and he, he had no intellectual no, awareness at all. So they gave me all the Bantam books that they got every mm. month. So I was surrounded by, by books and I read them and I read science fiction. And to me, this was, this was the coolest, most imaginative escape that I could ever come across and I was fascinated by it. And I, and the only talent I had again was reading. I had all these books available to me and I just read them and went off into these planets. And I thought that that was the best thing that I could do because I have a very big imagination. I still do. And I'm, I'm very hyperbolic and, <laughs> and I catastrophize and science fiction was just, the right thing for me and I found it and and yeah. 
and I, and I read it. And when I grew up, I had the honor of editing something with the late great science fiction grandmaster, Jim Gunn. And Jim Gunn published with Bantam and in one of those boxes then that I got from my uncle of Bantam, the Bantam books vice president who didn't care about books, there could have been something from Jim Gunn. So it was a harbinger to my future life. Oh, and, and by the way, I used to go, well, I was brought by my mom uh, all the time to the public library in Forest Hills. Uh, I used to walk down, walk, walk down from Kew Gardens. We went to the I, same library? I probably checked out some, since I'm a little a bit younger, I probably checked out some of the books that you had already checked out. Lance, my mouth is open. Like, oh. like, like I'm not in <laughs> professional podcast mode. I'm in friendship with Lance mode. We could have put our hands on the same books. It's, it's, in, it's, it, in fact, it, we probably almost certainly did. I mean, if you were checking out science fiction, because I was too. This is a, this is a revelation. Yeah. So tell me then, if the listeners are interested in science fiction, you know, from, uh, you know, there's a long tradition in general semantics where folks influenced by general semantics would include, you know, uh, uh, John W. Campbell, uh, A.E. Van Volk, uh, Robert Heinlein, Frank Herbert. Um, what would be the authors and, and if you like, the, the novels or books uh, that you would recommend folks read in the science fiction genre, you know, the top ones for you? To me, the top science fiction novel is Ursula Le Guin's The Left Hand of Darkness, where Jen Lee I and Estraven are walking across the ice and gender is not something that is demarcated in a, in a rigid way that gender is fluid and you could you could be you could you could be a man or you could be a woman and you're not stuck in the female or male body and it's so moving that once you finish once you finish reading the left hand of darkness you think it's normal that your gender could change and the world looks very strange to you because pe people are either male or female and it's to me sort of ludicrous that we're, we're stuck in these bodies and we don't, we'll never know what it's like to be in the other kind of body. And maybe one day they'll be able to put brains in computers and change them and we won't have bodies at all. I don't know, I'm not gonna see that. Yeah. But I love, I love the left hand of darkness and the, I, the, the idea of going into another planet where you can check where your gender where your gender changes and to me my favorite line in all of science fiction it's a very short sentence comes from the left hand of darkness which is the king was pregnant hmm. and if the king could like mel brooks says it's good to be the king and i don't think that anybody ever equated mel brooks is it's good to be the king with the king is the king was pregnant and i just did but i would say it's <laughs> I just I don't think anybody I don't think anybody ever did that, but it's good to be the king because you could have sex without worrying about being pregnant. Hmm. So the Left Hand of Darkness is is my favorite science fiction novel of all time. Well, I think folks would definitely want to check that out, and it's uh, it certainly relates to the early days of uh, the internet where people were able to change their identity and, uh, you know, and also in gaming, you know, play in some of these role-playing games where you could play as a female character. And then of course, in contemporary times with all of the uh, you know, kind of interest or discussion about uh, the trans transgender phenomenon. Uh, so sounds more relevant than ever actually. Yes. Now, and, and and that brings us then to science, feminist science fiction criticism, your claim to fame, and you've written a number of works, uh, including Alien to Femininity, uh, Lost in Space, Feminist fabula Fabulation, and Genre Fission, uh, as well as edited a bunch of anthologies and that special PMLA issue, and you're you're still going at it with a new one in the works about alternate history. What is your take as far as a feminist, as a feminist science fiction critic? I know you've kind of 
alluded to it before, but if we could sum it up now, you know, what does that mean for our listeners? Well, Grandmaster Jim Gunn said that science fiction can save the world. And I think that feminist science fiction can save the world for women because it gives you a way out of the patriarchal reality that we have, and it gives you a place to, to be an architect of difference and make blueprints about how to change the world for the better for women. Mm -hmm. and, and, and like people now love Octavia Butler and I knew Octavia Butler. And when I first read Octavia Butler, she, she, was, she was not famous and she wasn't glorified and I feel that I've been around long enough that I'm very happy to say the world has come to see things as I do in terms, in terms of literature. And I think that the most exciting literature now is science fiction. Mm -hmm. And I think still that science fiction is still the most potent proving ground for, for anti-patriarchal fabulation that we still need to remake the world so that women can live in it better. And I've, I've been saying this for years and I'm still saying it, but back to your question about did the world improve in terms of feminist science fiction criticism, my answer is absolutely yes, because there are all these women that followed me and the world in general agrees with me. Like if you ask a literate, person, do you think well of Octavia Butler? They would say absolutely yes. I will say, as you know, I, I teach a class on science fiction, film, and TV. Uh, and, you know, we use multiple perspectives and methods for analyzing science fiction narratives, audiovisual narratives, uh, including the, you know, feminist analysis of, of those. And, and uh, you know, one of the interesting things is that uh, up until, really, it doesn't start until we get into the 80s, but up until that point, science fiction, uh, at least film, is in, in almost entirely a male genre. And that's uh, feminist critics then found it quite interesting. And, and you know, folks like uh, Vivian Sobchak, for example, uh, because it was so completely male dominated and so obvious in its, in its kind of biases and, and also in the interesting symbolism where, you know, for example, in movies that involve, you know, space or alien invasion, you know, typically the aliens are somehow coded as feminine, even if they come across as male, but they're, coded as feminine where their threat is biological and, and involving reproduction, you know, even if they're plants or something. And that men, on the other hand, apart from being, you know, kind of heroic and militaristic are, uh, tend to be technological and, and associated with sci science and technology and kind of asexual in a lot of ways. So uh, the symbolism there uh, extends beyond male and female characters to male and female, or, or it was rather masculine and feminine traits that are projected onto, for example, machines as be, tending to be masculine and alien life forms as tending to be feminine. Uh, and so that makes for a very interesting kind of critical analysis. And then, of course, once we get to the 80s, we start to see with the movie Alien and, and, and Terminator and others, the introduction of female-centered, women-centered narratives where women take on the, the heroic role. And that, that dichotomy is certainly undermined and, and changed dramatically. I think so. And from what you're saying, I think feminist science fiction gives us a new perspective. And I think of my favorite science fiction feminist short story, Joanna Russ's When It Changed. And, and I named my first collection of 
of Trump stories when Trump changed and people don't know that I was alluding to Joanna Russ's when it changed because they're not that if they're not that well versed in science fiction but I was alluding to when it changed and while away while away is a, is a feminist utopia there are not men there and the three hunky male astronauts from earth land in while away and this is this is one of my feminist my favorite lines in science fiction too. The men see all the women and while away is perfectly fine and everything runs and they look around and they go, where, this is a quote from Russ, where are all the people? Hmm. Because they just see, they just see women and they don't see people. Ah. To, to these male astronauts, to these male astronauts, women are not people. That's very telling. Yes. Where are all the people? And actually, Pragmatically, women should have been the astronauts, not men, because women are smaller in the in the space capsules. Right, and 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 interestingly, um, the Soviets were doing that long before we started to include women on the space shuttle. Right, and very recently, a woman couldn't go into space because there wasn't a spacesuit that was built for her. This was like last right. summer. Last yeah. year, she couldn't go because the space the space the spacesuit didn't fit her. Like, what should she do? Go shopping for another one? Like things, things, and feminist science fiction gets us out of this rigidity. And in terms of the current moment, I have not seen the Barbie movie, but I've but I've read reviews of it. And to me, I think it's feminist science fiction. You have Barbie Land, and that's this is I I, and I think I'm not wrong because. When I first started with feminist science fiction, it wasn't labeled, and I had to crawl literally on my hands and knees in the science fiction section of the books, bookstore, being like a truffle hound, sniffing around, trying to see what was feminist science fiction. So I still, I still have my sniffing mechanism, and it tells me that I think that Barbie is, 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 it's, it's feminist science fiction because you have Barbie land and the Barbies rule everything and the men is subordinate and then Barbie comes to the real world and there's a switch. If this is not feminist science fiction, I don't know what is. So I have to see the movie and write this. So excuse right. me for pontificating about something that I haven't seen, but I'm, if mm -hmm. it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And I think this is that. It sounds perfectly reasonable to me. And, and I plan on seeing the movie uh, as well. But uh, I, I did a piece um, a long time ago uh, looking at Roger Rabbit, the, the movie uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, as science fiction in the sense of being an alternate history of Los Angeles. So uh, I, I fully support this idea that that uh, Barbie, the Barbie movie is science fiction as well. I can uh, definitely get behind that. Uh, I, look for, I look forward to what you write about that, but maybe turning to your own writing now, um, you know, and there is a sense in which people in literary, folks who get into literary theory and literary criticism are, you know, some might say are, are frustrated fiction writers and, or at least uh, certainly would be tempted to try writing their own fiction, uh, having studied it for so long. And you've written two novels, which was uh, Oi Pioneer and the sequel Oi Feminist Planets, and then these short stories. So I was wondering, you know, what were your thoughts or what can you tell us about getting into writing fiction now? There are few English professors who write fiction. And the ones I think of are the ones I've already mentioned. Catherine Stimson has written a novel, Leslie Fiedler wrote a novel, and Norm wrote a novel, but they each wrote one. And they will, they will never be known as great fiction writers. And I know that I am a much better literary critic than I am a fiction writer. Like I asked Jim Gunn what I thought of my writing and he always told the truth. And he goes, Marlene, your writing is cute. <laughs> so, hmm. so I'm a cute fiction writer and I'm a world-class science fiction critic, but okay, I take, I take my talent for, for what it's worth. And if I could write cute fiction and it's funny and, and people like it and people will publish it, fine. But I will never get a I will never get a Hugo Award and I will never get a Nebula Award and I accept that and I'm having fun and some people, some people like what I do. 
And to answer your question, I was able to switch into fiction writing because as I told you, I always wrote humorous criticism like nobody did in the first place. But I find that writing fiction and writing criticism are two different languages. And I could switch between them and I could and I can make the switch and I'm bilingual in fiction and in criticism. And when I started this interview with you with the personal descriptions, I knew perfectly well that that like no literary scholar would say such a thing, but I just went and did it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I speak in a different voice than the typical literary scholar. And because of that, I was able to make the transition to fiction where most literary scholars do not, do not write fiction. And even these very brilliant professors who I mentioned, they wrote one novel and then they stopped mm -hmm. because it, it's, it's very hard it's very hard to switch. And I'm very terrible at foreign languages. Like I failed the University of Michigan French test for master's degree students six times and the proctor was Peter and he liked me. And he said, Marlene, okay, I can't fail you anymore. Go past the goddamn thing, you've taken it six times. And Buffalo did not have a foreign language requirement. And if they did, I would still be there to this day trying to pass it. I cannot speak foreign languages. But what I can do is switch between scholar voice and fiction voice. And mm -hmm. I can write humor effortlessly. It's like a kid in summer camp, dear mommy and daddy, how are you camp is bad, it rained today. I can, I can write it like that. It, it, and in my novels, nobody edited them. It came out just the way, just the way I wrote it. So somehow, I don't know how or why, I just have this humorous voice and, and funny things come out of my mouth. So I was yeah. able to make the transition, but literary scholarship is definitely not funny. But to just to note, I mean, your novels, Oi Pioneer and Oi Feminist Planets, you could also say them, they kind of involve a kind of magic realism that connects to science fiction, but, you know, has that, that kind of feel as well because they're they don't take us completely out of the world they're kind of rooted in forest hills if you like yeah, yeah forest hills in there yes well yeah and and of course there there is so there's science fiction i mean uh, and you know I, i'm suggesting a bit of fantasy magic realism and and a whole lot of humor and then in your newly published uh collection there's also a lot of satire uh, involved in that. You want to tell us a bit about how you came to write, uh, you know, publish that collection. I, I know that these pieces were not all written at the same time. And were they published previously? No, they're, they're, they're all unique to the, to the volume. And this is the second, this is the second this former president of science fiction is retrospective retro rocket jettisons Trumpism is my second collection of Trump short fiction. First one was when Trump changed the feminist science fiction Justice League quashes the orange outrage pussy grabber. So I wrote them. I took what was real with Trump and I exaggerated it. And in my novels, I was writing about myself and I took what was real and I exaggerated it. So I, I did, I did the same thing in the Trump, in the two Trump short story collections and in the two, in the two novels. I really didn't make things up. I just took what was, and since I'm steeped in science fiction tropes, I applied the science fiction tropes to it. And I was able to write about Trump because being from Forest Hills, that's a stone's throw away from Jamaica Estates. And he went to elementary school 
at the Q Forest School, which is on Union Turnpike. Right, which I remember very well. I mean, I because I'm from Kew Gardens. I grew up in Kew Gardens, although that was, you know, I went to public school myself. So that was a different bunch of kids who went there. We were we were closer even to Jamaica States than you. But I, I lived in a tall building and I could see I could see Trump's, I could see Jamaica states from my house looking, oh. over, <laughs> looking over flushing meadows. Uh-huh. But, but now, although I, of course, would never say what, what Trump says, I speak in the same Queen's voice that he does. I have the accent. So it was very easy for me to take on his persona and make him worse. Well, I'm given your new book. Do you want to? Uh, I think you know our listeners would be interested in hearing something from it. Uh, would you mind uh, reading something from from yes. the collection? What I, what I would like to do is I would like to share my literary critical voice and my fiction voice. And what I want to do is to read the the first paragraph from my introduction to the book, which is like being a doctor diagnosing myself. The, the editor said, write an introduction, <laughs> write an introduction to your Trump stories. And that was me being a literary critic of myself. So I'll read the first paragraph from the introduction. And then I would like to share a story, a little short story. Great, great, okay. thank you. Um, So the introduction, in terms of what I was just telling you, the title is The Queen's English, or What's a Nice Feminist Scholar Like Me Doing Writing Science Fiction About a Former President Like This? I love titles, and I guess my titles are unique, too. And the introduction begins, Even though Trump is no literary critic, He defensively defines the phalanx of reality-based tell-all books written about him as fiction. Well, this former president, science fiction as retrospective retro rocket jettisons Trumpism, is, in fact, fiction. Fiction kills Trump's defense dead. Science fiction, in particular, zaps Trump's verbal force field to smithereens. So, Donald, You want to call science fiction fiction? Go ahead, make my day. Science fiction is more unreal than your alternative truths. Science fiction provides the best way to show that your incessant delusional prevarication is absurd rather than normal. Anything you could make up about science fiction, I could make up anything better. Science fiction can extrapolate anything better than you. Yes, it can. Yes, it can. Science fiction, which Grandmaster James Gunn often said can save the world, is bigger than your big lie. Science fiction, via satirized yielding cognitive estrangement, can expose you and save America from you. Science fiction can send you to a galaxy far, far away from us. That is why I wrote this former president. It's a powerful statement. Seriously, I think that that I really, really wanted to do something to try to nullify Trump. And I think that I was trying to act in my in with my little talent that is nothing like Mel Brooks's talent, but act use New York Jewish humor to ridicule him because ridicule is a potent weapon. And that's the only weapon that I had. And I think with Trump, in terms of Neil Postman, that we're amusing ourselves to death with him to the point of being ludicrous, that I watch MSNBC and it it is wall to wall coverage of Trump every night. And and I can't even follow the indictments anymore. And and I'm a literary critic. I can't I, I can't keep up with it and I and I watch it and I read the times from cover to cover and it's getting too much and we are amusing ourselves to death. And I think I think that I really potently feel that I have to do something. And the only thing that I could do is is raise my voice and speak and use my science fiction knowledge to ridicule him and try to do something, but nobody can get rid of him. Nobody, nobody. 
uh, and we all know the, the Congress couldn't, the Mueller report couldn't. I don't, I, I don't know if, if this Jack Smith person could do it. He seems pretty formidable, but it's impossible. He's like a science fiction monster that nobody can hmm. quash. So I'm doing here my using my best talents to do it. So I'll give you an example of how I take science fiction and apply it to Trump to try to hit at him with ridicule. And I'm going to read a story called Trump Needs Ghostbusters. And you will recognize that it's sodden with my knowledge of, of Queens and being a Queens denizen. Okay. Okay. All the Ghostbusters in Queens were having a field day after word got around that Fred and Marianne McClough Trump appeared perched on Norgahide Lazy Boy recliners floating above their graves in Middle Village's Lutheran All Faith Cemetery. Fred was reading the New York Times. Are you angry that I referred to the dead? True, two wrongs don't make a right. But think of how Trump treated the deceased John McCain. Fred Trump was a racist who attended Ku Klux Klan rallies. And as for Mary, well, she had to know what was going on. This is just a story. Get over it. The Trump parents lounge chair levitation thing happened just as the Operation Varsity Blues college admission cheating scandal was going down. Look, Mary. The Times reports that via a scam called Operation Varsity Blues, wealthy parents paid to have their children gain college admission by misrepresenting the students as talented athletes and falsifying their SAT scores, said Fred. We did that for Donald. His grades at Fordham were too terrible for him to get admitted to Penn. And our granddaughter, Mary, just told the world how Donald hired a friend to take the SATs for him. We were ahead of our time, Fred answered as he leaned back in his recliner. Don't rest on your laurels. That was then and this is now. Mueller is going after Donald. You always financially intervene to help him. What would have happened if you didn't bail him out after his casino failure fiasco? Even though we're dead, we can't leave him in the lurch. Mueller might indict Trump. Our son could go to prison. Fred leaned back further, folded the times and considered the problem. Since we're ghosts, we can take supernatural action, Fred said. We can, for example, inveigle ourselves within Mueller's brain and interfere with his ability to author his report. Sounds good, let's go. Fred and Mary floated down to Washington, walked through the walls of Mueller's house, and appeared above his bed while he slept. We're here, now what? asked Mary. I'm a builder. We will build a beautiful invisible wall in Mueller's bedroom. When he wakes up, he will hit his head against it in the exact spot where the brain controls making conclusions. He will then be unable to indict Donald. Mary stared at Muller's night table. Look, Muller's report is here. It's over 300 pages. Who would believe that someone could compile so many pages and fail to come to a conclusion? I'll just follow through with the plan and hope for the best, said Fred, as he began to build a wall out of piled invisible Norgahide lazy boy recliners. Muller awoke hit his head according to Fred's plan and hence was unable to indict Trump. He delivered his report to Attorney General William Barr. Looking up from the story, thank God William Barr is no relation to me. I have enough trouble. Okay, back to the story. <laughs> Barr announced that Mueller had exonerated Trump. I'm totally exonerated. There's no collusion. Total exoneration. Trump repeatedly proclaimed. That's my boy, said Fred. You're a killer, not a loser. Great lying. Another ghost joined Fred and Mary in Muller's bedroom. Father, what are you doing here? Asked Fred. Hello, son, said Friedrich Trump. I've come to get credit where credit's due. 
I'm responsible for Donald's wonderful propensity to lie. I thought that he possessed innate lying talent. Das ist richtig. Das ist ri nicht richtig. You never knew that when Donald was a child, I materialized and hit his head against one of the columns which adorns your Jamaica estate's house. The impact deactivated his brain's veracity control center. Donald, as a result, does not have the ability ever to tell the truth. Good job, Father. You, saved, you served our family well. A lot of Donald's success is derived from lying. I look forward to floating above his favorite horns to watch him lie about the day he, he joins us. That is definitely not going to happen, stated a fourth ghost who had just appeared in Muller's bedroom. It's getting crowded in here. Who is this ghost, inquired Friedrich? John McCain, Mary, Mary solemnly answered. Trump's lying days are over. Whenever he lies, I will use ectoplasmic ink to skywrite to sky the truth so, so that it will be invisible to the entire country, said McCain. Fred, Mary, and Friedrich returned to their res respective graves. Not so for McCain, who incessantly haunted Trump. I'm totally exonerated, Trump shouted on Fox News. The following ectoplasmic inked words appeared in the sky directly above the Fox studio. Not so, Trump is not exonerated. And the following voiceover was broadcast simultaneously with the appearance of the text in the sky. I'm the ghost of John McCain. I paid for this ad. I like presidents who don't get indicted for lying. Luckily, McCain's ghost had an endless supply of ectoplasmic ink. After hearing Stephen K. Bannon say that Trump would go, was going to go full animal in response to Mueller's report, McCain's ghost turned Trump into a dung beetle. The ghost enjoyed watching Trump feed off his own prevaricating bullshit. Trump's first and final term ended after he successfully turned America into a shithole country. Thanks to McCain's ghost, Trump lived out his remaining days in the form of an insect. Fred and Mary were eventually disappointed to learn that their son would not be joining them in the Lutheran All Faith Cemetery. Instead, when his time came, he was buried in a pet cemetery. The end. Wow. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, Lance. And for our listeners, I want to highly recommend Marlene's uh, novels are both hilarious, Oi Pioneer and Oi Feminist Planets. I know not everyone shares your political views, but I think everyone could agree that you are, again, a great satirist and, and humor writer. And so these two collections, the earlier one, when Trump changed the feminist science fiction Justice League quashes the orange outrage pussy grabber. It's the earlier one. And the one you just read from, hot off the press, hot, uh, the former president science fiction as retrospective, retro rocket, jettisons Trumpism. These are come highly recommended. And uh, I want to thank you, Marlene, for this interview today, for joining us in conversation and, and for that wonderful reading. Thank you, Lance. I thoroughly enjoyed the experience of talking to you as I always do. And I was honored by what you just said. And I thank you for having me. It was an extreme pleasure. You're very welcome. And again, thank you, Marlene Barr. Thank you. You've been listening to our July 2023 episode of Semantic Reactions featuring an interview with author Marlene Barr. If you like what you've heard, or even if you haven't, please consider becoming a member of the Institute of General Semantics, if you're not one already. In addition to supporting our efforts, IGS members receive an annual subscription to our journal, etc., a review of general semantics, access to our online and in-person events, lectures and seminars, and discounts on the books and audiovisual materials that we sell. Regular membership is only $50 and half off for students. Your membership and any additional donations you care to make will help to support our offerings and activities 
as we work to bring a measure of sanity to the world. The Institute of General Semantics is a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to research and education on a wide range of topics. They include language and symbols, meaning and perception, communication and representation, media and technology, science and epistemology, creativity, and critical thinking. We are dedicated to making the world a better place through practical strategies for improving our semantic environment, individually and collectively. For more information about the Institute and our activities, and to become a member and supporter of our work, please visit our website at generalsemantics.org. That's generalsemantics, one word, dot org. And this brings to a close our 11th episode of Semantic Reactions, the official podcast of the Institute of General Semantics. This is Ben Houck, signing off, saying, we hope you'll join us next time. And until then, just remember this simple fact, that the map is not the territory.